Good evening and thanks for joining us once again on Channel 514 and SPK Plus. And I'll say by way of a little announcement that lately my new videos have pretty consistently been failing to upload successfully on my Google Plus page, SPK Plus. So although I'm saying welcome to Channel 514 and SPK Plus, it's likely that the new videos until I figure out what's wrong or until my luck changes are going to be available only on the YouTube channel. But in any case, we are continuing our series Exploring Ancient Literature, and what we're going to be doing in this episode is exploring a, an area in Egyptian literature which your, uh, you will find is really quite large and pretty diverse. And the area in Egyptian literature to which I'm referring is what I'm going to call wisdom literature. And I'm calling it that pretty provisionally because, in fact, that might be the best term I can think of off the top of my head, but it's and it's a pretty conventional term, but it's not perfect, and really there's more to this literature than that, than wisdom sayings and that sort of thing. So, again, we're using the literature of Ancient Egypt from Yale University Press, and the texts that we're discussing make up part three of the book. There's one that's actually in another section toward the end that is uh, much later than the others, but this part of the book, part three, is called Instructions, Lamentations, and Dialogues by the editor, William Kelly Simpson. So you can see that there's more to it than wisdom sayings and all that, but wisdom literature in general and literature that entails a lot of reflections on life and meditations on problems in life like suffering or wickedness. You find these things spread throughout the ancient Near East, so this genre or this overall phenomenon in ancient literature is a common thing in the ancient Near East. It's very widespread. So, of course, there are plenty of examples of it in the Old Testament, such as Proverbs, of course, and Job is usually considered one of these, and Wisdom, and the book known as Sirach or Ecclesiasticus, and also Ecclesiastes, and so as we go along, just for convenience's sake or to give you a convenient frame of reference, I'll be comparing some of these Egyptian texts to different biblical books to which they are roughly comparable in some way, or to which they possibly have some close connection, or at least some kind of relation. And the, the example primarily that I'm thinking of is Proverbs and the instruction of Amenemope, which have some sections or some verses that are, that are virtually the same or that, that communicate pretty much the same ideas with very similar wordings. And so, anyway, let's see if there's anything else I want to say to introduce this topic, but rather than read from any of these, actually reading passages from them, I think it would take, it would really take too long to do that, and so we're just going to glide along through this long succession of texts, and I'll put them into different categories and describe them one by one as briefly as I can. So, but again, it's a huge neighborhood in, in Egyptian literature that we're exploring tonight. So, and that's why I'm doing it, I'm trying to do it efficiently. So in any case, let's start with some texts that are pretty comparable 
to books, biblical books, like Proverbs, or like the Deuterocanonical book, which Protestants would call an apocryphal book, which we usually call Sirach or Ecclesiasticus. Ecclesiasticus is the older traditional Christian name for that book. Anyway, both of these books, Proverbs and Ecclesiasticus, they include a lot of wisdom sayings, these maxims that a, a father is transmitting to his son, or that the personified female figure of wisdom is transmitting to her hearers, and these texts that we're going to start with, these Egyptian texts, they kind of follow a similar model. They include a lot of sayings that are meant to inculcate a good attitude towards practical affairs or to, to prepare a young person to handle their practical affairs in a wise way and in an upright way and to help instill good values into them so that they'll live in accordance with good principles like wisdom itself of course and justice and fidelity to God and to um, to the community, to the state, to family, etc. So in these Egyptian texts instead of a personified female figure of wisdom like you find in the Old Testament you'll find a lot about the concept of ma'at, which is a rich religious and philosophical concept in Egyptian thought that has to do with truth and justice and rectitude and righteousness and good things like that, all of which can be capitulated under this, under this heading, this concept of ma'at. So a lot of these texts, they have to do with the monarchical government in some way because having a strong united monarchy in Egyptian life was seen as indicative that Ma'at was, was, shall we say, present in the land or that it was being upheld in the land and in a time of disorder you would say that Ma'at was not being upheld and so everything was just wrong and chaotic and bad. So these texts that we're discussing, they pretty much all have a lot to do with this concept, or it, it comes up frequently in there, but in these first few, the scene that we're to imagine is usually that of an elder, a father, or some kind of high official instructing his son in general, his son or his successor. And so, one example, the first of these, would be the instruction of Hardadef. Now, if you remember from our, from when we read the Song of the Harper in our first study in our ten-part series, Quality of Life and the Harper, what was one of the first lines in there? It was, I have heard the words of Imhotep and Hardadef, whose maxims are repeated intact as proverbs. But what of their places? Their walls are in ruins, and their places are no more, as if they had never existed. So what the harper, our poet there, is telling us is that people, these legendary sages like Hardadef, who is supposed to have been a son of King Khufu, and who appears as a character in a story that we took a look at a few videos back, Khufu and the Magicians, Hardadef and Imhotep, a vizier and a polymath and architect who served under King Zoser or Djoser in the Third Dynasty, and built for him the step pyramid at Saqqara, so the founder, so to speak, of the tradition of pyramid building, that these men had lived in the past and that their maxims had been repeated all the way down to the time of the Harper, even though their places are no more, their walls are in ruins, etc. And so you can't find them anywhere, but you hear their words everywhere you go. And so 
The first of these texts is the instruction of Hardedef, and all we have in this volume that we're using here is the, the very first bits of it, the introduction. And after that, we have the maxims of Patahotep. So Patahotep was supposed to have been a vizier in the sixth dynasty in the Old Kingdom, and this text may have go back that far, or it may have parts that go back that far. I'm not sure what the state of that question is today, but it may just as easily come from the Middle Kingdom, which was a time of a time when Egyptian literature really flourished, which is why it's sometimes called the Middle Kingdom Renaissance. So, Ptahhotep, that's a pretty long text. It's, uh, it's quite long, actually, and the scene that we imagine there is that the vizier Ptahhotep is instructing his successor and teaching him his wisdom so that he can then step down and pass on his responsibilities and his office to someone else. And so, as you can imagine, there's a lot in there about court life and being an official and how to serve the king well and do your job responsibly and correctly and assiduously, etc., etc. And how to be just and upright and not oppress anyone. So I can't really do it justice, and rather than delve into it farther, we should, I think we should keep moving. But in the same vein, we have a text called The Teaching for the Vizier Kagemni, of which only very little is preserved in this volume that I have here. And I think, actually, that the text that's used for that is found on the same papyrus as the best copy that exists today of the maxims of Ptahhotep. So possibly they're related in some way, or the two texts just were thought to go together very naturally in their heyday, or in the Middle Kingdom. So after that, what do we have after that? We have a similar text to Kagemni, the instruction of Amunakte, and I don't think it's really worth describing much about that. I think that there, if memory serves, there's a part in there about eating at banquets and not, not, um, no, okay, I'm thinking of something else, so, in any case, but it's about it, oh, okay, the scene in this one is a scribe, Amunakte, and he's instructing his apprentice, who's called Hormin. But in any case, right after that in this volume, we have the instruction of Amenem, Amenemope, and that's a bit longer. And I would say the most outstanding feature of it is all this stuff about not getting involved with an argumentative person, or not getting into needless strivings and controversies with others and not being covetous or acquisitive or making trouble for oneself through wrongdoing and mischief making. Now, another of these, let's see, Oh, there's another called The Instruction of a Man for His Son, which also tends to be this, you know, full of, the, it's, it's short, but, but what we have of it is just more sapiential sayings and maxims that a father might impart to his son about how to live well, and so on and so on. So you can see why I say that these texts are more comparable to Proverbs or Ecclesiasticus than to another biblical wisdom book, like, say, Ecclesiastes or wisdom, or, um, what's another one? Job is a, would be a, another example, so you wouldn't really compare any of those to these, you would more compare Proverbs or Ecclesiasticus to them, but we can't stop there because there are a few more broad categories that I've divided these into just for the purposes of this video, but there are a couple here in which the scene is that if a king instructing his son and successor as to how he's supposed to rule so and as to what sort of situation he's going to find himself in on acceding to the throne. 
And so one of these, the teaching of Mary Carre, this, I believe, it might take too long to look it up because I'd like to nail down exactly what the time period of that is supposed to be. I see. So it's King Keti of the Heracleopolitan line addressing his son, Mary Carre. And that's right, they live in, they're supposed to have, you know, these kings lived in the first intermediate period, although the text may have been written in the Middle Kingdom, which followed the first intermediate period. So during the intermediate periods, Egypt was divided and was in turmoil, etc. So during the kingdoms, the old, middle, and new kingdom, it was united under a single monarchy, even though one dynasty of kings would follow another as one died out or was overthrown, etc. But so in this text, we're supposed to imagine a divided, chaotic kingdom that's slowly being brought back together and that these kings, the, the old father who is giving his, his last wishes here, Keti, and his son and successor, Mary Carre, that they are taking on the difficult task of taking Egypt through this difficult time and hopefully restoring the happier times of the past. So anyway, I would say the thing that distinguishes this text most is that it goes for this sense of historical realism. So there's a lot in it about the particulars of the situation in which the, in which things were, the state of affairs at the time of these kings. So he says, you know, your border in this area is insecure and you have a good alliance with these people over there, this tribe and this other country, or you have good relations with this family. And so, and so if you were going to compare this to something in biblical, in the biblical books, I'd say you could compare it to this interesting passage in First Kings, at the very beginning of First Kings, or at the very beginning of Third Kings in the Douay Reims, in which the dying King David is instructing the young Solomon as to how he should rule, and in what ways is he at an advantage, and how is he at a disadvantage, and who is going to be loyal, who is not going to be loyal, whom he should kill, and whom he should reward, etc. So that's a passage in the life of David that you don't hear much about, but in my opinion it's one of the most interesting passages in all of the historical books in the Old Testament, and really it would be worthwhile to, to hear more about it, but anyway, you could compare this Egyptian text, the teaching of King Mary Kare, to that. So. The other text in this category in which a dying king is instructing his son and successor is the teaching of King Amenemhet I. So Amenemhet I, you may remember, is the king who dies and is possibly assassinated, although it's not clear that that was the case, at the beginning of the Tale of Sinuhe, which we read in our last two videos. And so he is immediately followed by his son, Senwosret I. And so these are the first two kings of the 12th dynasty in the Middle Kingdom. And it seems that in the Egyptian cultural memory, the reign of Amenemhet and his son, Senwosret, was remembered as being particularly treacherous or troubled by dissensions and betrayal and turmoil within the close circles of the royal household. And so that's really reflected in this text, because while there is a little bit of what you find in the teaching for King Mary Carre about the details of politics and economic life and the fortunes of Egypt, 
at his time. There's more about how the king just can't trust anybody, how there may be a lot of impressive and auspicious things about kingship, but the sad fact of it is that no one surrounding the king can be trusted. At one point he says, when you lie down to sleep, your own heart must keep watch over you because you can't trust anyone else to keep watch over you. Or he says, I gave my trust to these people, or I gave this to this person, and whatever I gave to anybody, they used it in some way to plot against me. And so it has what has been described as sort of a Machiavellian or a, a dim, sad, gloomy view of of life in the royal court, or of monarchical politics, etc. So those are our two texts about a king in, instructing his son, the teaching for King Mary Carre, and the teaching of King Amenemhat I. Now, moving right along, there's also a subset of these texts which are called the Loyalist Tradition. They're sort of given this scholarly nickname, the Loyalist Tradition. So it's not hard to guess what that's all about. The speakers in these texts are usually promoting the observance of Ma'at, or living in accord with Ma'at, or loyalty to the king, or how desirable it is that Egypt should have a strong monarchy. And so one of these is actually called the Loyalist Instruction, so that would be one example of these. I believe the others are a text called the Lamentations of Kakepere Sonbe and the Prophecies of Neferti. So in either of these, the speaker laments the sorry state of affairs, how there's chaos and disorder, and there's, there's sedition, there are malcontents, and so there are all these dangers to Ma'at and to Egypt's felicity and prosperity and righteousness. And, and in one of them, at least, in the prophecies of Neferti, the close of the text, or the latter part of it, is foretelling how a new dynasty is going to rise and bring back the good old days and restore Ma'at, etc. So I'm not sure that's also the case with Chakepere Sonbe, or even really where all the accents should go in that long mouthful of a name, but. Let's see if I can just... Oh, it's actually a lot shorter than I thought it was. <laughs> well, there's this nice... There isn't any prophecy at the end of this one. No. So you could, you could really call that a pretty straightforward lamentation, so... And of course, there's a biblical book just called Lamentations, and we can see from this, from the existence of texts like the, these two that I just described, that the Lamentation is another one of these pretty widespread genres in the literature of the ancient Near East, but without developing that idea, I want to cover just one more section here, one more arbitrary grouping of texts, and those are texts that are more comparable to Job, probably, than to another biblical book. And the reason I say that is that rather than handing on wisdom sayings or painting a picture of a transition or a transitional period, or a difficult period, or a, a storied, celebrated period in Egyptian history, what these texts do is sort of reflect on the problems of life. And so one example of these, I think the strongest example, would be a text called The Man Who Was Weary of Life. And this is also known as the dialogue of a man with his soul, or with his ba, which is an Egyptian 
mythological religious term for a part of the human soul that goes to live in the underworld. So the man who was weary of life, that's the text, uh, that's the name that's used for the text in this volume that we're using. What happens in this, as you can guess, is that there is literally a dialogue between the man and his ba, and so the man has death on his mind and how life has become burdensome to him or wearisome to him. He's weary of life, and so there will be long strings of poetic sayings that start with the same line over and over again, like, Behold, my very being is loathsome, more than, I believe, the stench of a corpse or the smell of vultures or some, you know, on a summer day when it's hot and all of these nasty things like that. Or, Who can you trust today because a man robs his friend and things like that. Or, What's the what's the last one? Death is before me today. And when he's saying this over and over again, he's comparing death to nice things or things that give you a sense of relief, like death is before me today, like going outside after an illness. So what would be another example of these? There's a text called Admonitions of an, e of an Egyptian Sage, and I think that is also one that you could group in this category. That's, yeah, I think so. You could kind of consider it a lamentation by the same token. It's also known as the admonitions of Ipuwer, and it probably comes from the Middle Kingdom. But it also seems to be sort of remembering and evoking the chaos of the First Intermediate Period. But in any case, the admonitions of an Egyptian sage, or the admonitions of Ipuwer, it's fairly lengthy, and there's a lot there's a lot of lamentations in it. There's a lot in it about what's wrong with the kingdom. So more about what's wrong with the kingdom, less about what's wrong with life, although the two in, in Egyptian thought are inextricably connected. Now let's see. I think we might be at the end of our list, although... There's one that is actually a text from much later times. It would be from Ptolemaic times or later, but it's known as the Instruction of Ankh Sheshonki. Really a mouthful of a name there, just like Kakepere Sonbi, but let's see. Uh, it's also sort of a, a narrative, sort of a romance about a conspiracy against a king. But after telling a little bit of story, it goes into a long, really a, quite a lengthy series of sapiential sayings that are, are pretty diverse and pretty broad and reflect really the, the breadth of, of teaching and sayings and things that you find in, in wisdom literature on the whole. So that's the instruction of Ankh Shashonki. And again, that's written in the Demotic language, D-E-M-O-T-I-C, which is a, a cursive or a simplified writing system that was used in Egypt in the Hellenistic period and later times. I think it developed in the Hellenistic period, maybe just a little earlier than that, if, if any earlier. But let's see now. So we covered that. We covered all of those. And that's right. There's one more thing in this video that I wanted to tack on at the end because it's another wisdom text, but not an Egyptian text, actually an Assyrian text. Because when we were discussing the Mesopotamian classics, somehow this text completely slipped my mind, and if I'm going to tack it on somewhere, I might as well do it right here. But this is known as the story of Ahikar, and you can find this on sacredtext.com and on websites that focus on extra-biblical literature. There's one site that, inc that includes it, I forget the name of it, but unfortunately it's, it's a Mormon site, so it includes all of this bad Mormon literature, but also it includes the story of Ahikar. And so this text is actually mentioned, or the character Ahikar, who was 
a semi-legendary Assyrian sage, and vizier is mentioned in the book of Tobit, which is another of the seven deuterocanonical books that are considered canonical by Catholics and Orthodox and apocryphal by Protestants. And so in this book, the char this character Ahikar is related to the main characters, the family of main characters in the book of Tobit or Tobias. Tobit is the father and Tobias or Tobiah is his son and they're related to this guy Ahikar. And I think at the end he comes to Tobias's wedding or he comes to celebrate with the family in some way. But um, in this text about him, which is an Assyrian text, and that's another thing that makes it interesting. Um, let's see, because in Assyrian literature, one of the reasons why we didn't talk about it much is that you don't find as much in there that's literary in, in a real sense, in the sense that we usually use the word literary, as you do in lower Mesopotamian literature. So you kind of find more literature coming from lower Mesopotamia, Babylonia, than you do coming from Assyria. And when we were discussing Mesopotamian literature, I skipped all of the this epigraphy, all of these royal stelae and things like the Prism of Sennacherib or the Code of Hammurabi and all of these all of these official enactments and proclamations and records of the kings about how they conquered these people and killed those people and built this building and that building, etc. But Ahikar would be a very literary text from Assyria. And so the character Ahikar is a close associate and a favorite of one of the Neo-Assyrian kings, Esarhaddon, and he does all kinds of great things for the king. He solves impossible puzzles and answers difficult questions, and at one point the king sends him to the king of Egypt, actually, so there's a connection with Egyptian literature there, uh, if you want to call it that. The Assyrian king, he sends Ahikar to Egypt to solve things, do these impossible things, or solve seemingly impossible problems for the king of Egypt. Like at one point he manages to get these little kids to fly on the backs of eagles, and I forget what the point of that is, it, it's something to do with connecting the earth and the sky or something, but... It seems like no one can do it, but he does it. And so then Ahikar's wicked nephew conspires against him and has him imprisoned, contrives to have him imprisoned, and he falls out of favor with the king. But eventually he's able to restore himself to the king's good graces, and his wicked nephew is given to him as a slave. And so at the very end, Ahikar curses his wicked nephew, who then swells up and bursts. It's really very gross, but um, along the way there are sections where Ahikar launches into a series of wisdom sayings, and a lot of these are pretty pretty memorable and, and interesting and fun. Like, there are a couple that I remember about wolves, where the wolf is a metaphor for a wicked person, and in one of these, they all begin with the words, my son. So, my son, have you heard this? You know, so he says, my son, they, they made the wolf go to school, and they told him, say the letter A, say the letter B, because they're trying to teach him to read. But all the wolf says is things about how he wants to eat animals. Like he says, I want lamb and goat in my belly, and, and things like that. So it's, uh, it's all about how you can't reform a wicked person who's determined to just prey on and victimize other people. I'm guessing that that's what we're supposed to take away from that, but there's another where they say, where he says, my son, they said to the wolf, don't go near the sheep because their dust will harm you. That's what he says, their dust will harm you. So there, there's something that they, you know, they raise dust when they walk or they have dander or something, so it's going to get in your lungs, you know, so 
uh, the wolf, though, he says, no, no, they're something about them. The if it's their dust or if it's something else about them, he says it's good for my eyes. So. So they're telling the wolf, you better stay away from, you, you want to eat the animals, but you better stay away from them because it's for your own good, you know. But, but the wolf, um, he, you know, says, no, no, it's really, uh, they really are good for me, you know. So there's another, I suppose that's another message about the difficulty of reforming someone who's given over to wicked ways. But in any case, that's the story of Ahikar. And... So I thought I would tack that on to our discussion of Egyptian wisdom literature because it's sort of broadly in the same category and it also serves as an illustration, I guess, of how widespread this sort of literature was in the ancient Near East, the Old Orient. So there you have it. I think I'll stop that video, this video here. And next time, I think we'll get back into some narrative literature from later times in Egyptian history. So at this point, we've probably covered most of the, the great literature of the Middle Kingdom that we're going to cover, although there will be some chronological jumping around in our next few videos. And after we've made our way around the block of Egyptian literature, we'll move on into Greek and Roman literature, but starting with Homer, probably starting with Homer, that seems like the natural thing to do. But thanks again for, or thanks for the first time if I haven't thanked you already, but thanks again, now that is the second time, for watching this, for staying with us, and I hope to be with you again very soon on Channel 514 and hopefully an SPK Plus at some point when I can manage to upload new videos there again successfully. But we'll see you soon then, and in the meantime, have a great week, and sleep well, and we'll see you soon.